But there's something else that... Just let me finish yeah. this one thing about imitating some people. Because I would, Charlie Fairbanks, who's dead now, who's the, uh, the pillar of that community, I was to I play Charlie, and I imitated him, I talked to him, and I got to like the man. And you see, as an actor, I do, I would see the, the incredible complexity of a real person. And then I would imitate him and go, this is just shit. It's so facile, it's so not, it's so minuscule compared to what he is. That's how I would feel in the inside. Now, being on the inside and acting is, of course, much different than people watching you. It's a really tricky translated no man's land between. So anyways, that's how I would feel. Until you did it to the audience. And it was like actually being, like it was like Kool-Aid and adding water to something. Suddenly you had this full-blown drink. I would think it was mingy, minuscule, and false. It was so inept, my imitation of Charlie Fairbanks, and people afterwards, you're just like him. You're actually more like him than he is himself. But it was their imagination. And that's also a very important, I don't think I ever understood it at the time, that connection that an audience makes, that my acting wasn't happening in me, it was happening in them. Now, I had something to do with it, but to claim ownership of, what well, a magnificent actor I am, it's humbling in a way, and it's also relieving to go, I'm just doing my little thing here, well, and this experience that I have is different, and they're adding to it. So, and it comes back in, as I become an ancient actor, where I go, I think to me, it's, there's the great thing about theater and acting, it has to do by example. That by watching people be brave and imaginative on stage, it encourages the people watching them to be brave and imaginative themselves and suddenly transcend the, the, they're not just watching, that's when the real participation comes in. And I'm not sure it's what we're doing or telling them what to do. It's just the mere fact that we're playing at that intensity. Is a, because we're, as humans, we're very sympathetic. Guy comes at you angry, you're angry back. Guy admits something to you, you admit something back. You know? So this kind of brave, make-believe, pretending. So you're saying the way that life is played out on stage in a pretend way affects the way an audience It allows works. them to pretend in a very, in the, in, the, in, the, in the same serious way as we as in this field pretend. And that can go all the way from the silly and the profane to the sacred. Yeah. It can go from me seeing Gary Cooper when I'm six in a movie coming out as a six-year-old going, I feel like Gary Cooper, I'm going to act like Gary Cooper, all the way to the more profound and even and yeah. sacred parts that you yeah. actually, your spirit, when you see Lear go through his cleanse, so to speak, you actually something again happens. I'm speaking mostly of the live theater performance yeah. idea that is because you know I think plays are an excuse for theater to happen I mean you have to have some construct of something and it has to be provocative in certain ways but the real issue is not what's happening on stage the real issue is people suddenly bravely imagining that's the real thrill of it theater is an excuse for a play to happen no, no. plays are an excuse for theater to happen the theater of the people, the theater of well, the, the audience, theater the theater of, of the this. What the I'm talking about, the... because imagination is about imagination is how we join ourselves to the rest of the world. That's the deep satisfaction, in my thinking, of art. Right. Is imagination by and by imagination we stop the world, we stop and we join to it, we join to each other. The play can be about anything. We all market them. They're about this, and we God knows we can direct them where I want them to look here. No, no, I want them to look there. I'm not so sure that that's not like, I'm, you know, you can make people do that. And film certainly is more, far more fascistic and dictatorial about, I'm going to cram this little film, I mean this, <laughs> with my imagination. You don't have to imagine anything. You just have to watch it. Yeah, you consume it. You yeah. don't participate. You know, watch it. You know, you, you don't consume. participate in the same way. Now, not all films like that, but we certainly do have a lot of right. stuff that is that. And I, in theater, you can have, I mean, it's all, I mean, I'm, we're talking, it's so easy to talk about it in these ways. It's so difficult to do. But it seems to me, the more I've come to think of it, I'm, I, I think that that's what it is. The deep satisfaction is, in this moment, I am in this moment, imagining, pretending. And that pretending is connecting me to things that I otherwise, that a lie or a lay this feeling of isolation and separateness. We live and die alone. Yep. 
and that's and why art is so we need. And even in in the sort of narrative sense, there you are doing 1837, there you're doing the oil show, there you're doing but of the farm show, you are actually saying to those community audiences or wherever they are, not only your imaginations are important, and not only your sense of theater is important, you are important, your story is important, your community is important, and your country is important. And that had never been said before in the theaters and television, because you say, you went to the theaters in Saskatchewan. No, and again, and you, you, talked about me, piece. you talked about me owning it. Those people watching me, they own it too. Yeah. And that's a different thing. I mean, I've done enough. Uh, you know, where audiences come up to me and they love what I do, but they, they feel part of it. They feel they own it. It's not about I've given them some wonderful gift that I'm separate from them. They feel, again, that same sense of ownership about it. It's theirs. And they have, they have also created it. And, that's, and that you don't get when you're pretending to be an American play. Or, and again, I think in English Canada, we have a great sense of translation. We see so much stuff that's from someplace else that we're used to automatically going, well, that's sort of like where I come from. And I can see that, how that works because it's sort of like that here. But when somebody goes, Moose Jaw, and they're from fucking Moose Jaw, they go, yeah. And they go, and they own it. Like Corner Gas was a perfect example of a television of people saying, yeah, that's, that's mine too. Yeah. Not you guys, I loved it, but it's mine. Yeah. And I can show this to other people in the world, going, this is mine. This is my television show. I see. You, you give Canadians ownership of their own story. Right. Whereas when they're watching CSI or they're watching this or they're watching Brad Pitt or they're watching Tom Cruise, they don't have any ownership of the story. They don't even have any ownership, but, and it's even worse than that, but they don't have anything else out there that they do own to, to be beside it, like in the world with it. And that's also devastating in a funny way. And now it's not, it's not the same in all art across Canada. Books, for example, we can go, these are our books, there's are their books. We can like our books in music. This is our music. This is their music, and, you know. In this, but in film and television, we have in English, we have a very difficult time finding things to go. This is my television that I love, and it's about me, and I partly own, and I, it's also a contribution to world culture in in television terms, and stands up there with Belgian television, Norse. Is that experience at all? If you were in the Wizard of Oz, if you were in the Wizard of Oz and you were playing the Wizard, you know, great production, people love it, all jump up the end. Can that same experience happen? Sorry, as what? If you're in the, uh, giving the audience ownership of that story and engagement in that story because it's then theirs. If you are doing a story like Wizard of Oz, can that ever happen? Not, to, uh, not by my lights, it can't, no. The Wizard of Oz is feeding that colonial mindset. It's adding, it's just adding further to your so the satisfaction about going to the Wizard of Oz is the temporary, by watching it, alleviating, alleviating, alleviating yourself from self-loathing. This is an American thing, I'm watching an American thing, they're doing it like Americans in here. I mean, and again, I, you know, that, that's commercial theater. Where I would but argue. still, it has the subtext of when I see, you know, Bullets Over Broadway, or when I see Showboat, or when I see Miss Saigon, or when I see Me Les Mis, I am the audience, I enjoy it, I'm in it, but I'm always put in, I know my place, because it's not my story, it's someone else's story, and I like this, but it's not me, it's not of us. And it is, you, you consume an entertainment experience, but you don't join the theater of it. Well, well, again, you might, in even its best tradition of it, in the best of it, you might go, it's, I can enjoy it, because there is a universality in it that's been discovered because it's specific to somebody else's culture. And the specific, the specificity that is required in these art forms also, paradoxically, I'm not saying anything new, leads to the universality. It's only when I can actually truly act me and my Uncle Charlie that me and my Uncle Charlie can be understood by somebody in China as well as everybody else. To pretend that I'm going to act a, you know, a Chinese Uncle Charlie and me as a Chinese person, in a kind of generic way, it just will be cheap something.